who have squandered your blessings and misused your graces by obstinately persisting in their errors. Do not look upon their errors, but upon the love of your own Son and upon his bitter passion, which he underwent for their sake, since they too are enclosed in his most compassionate heart. Bring it about that they also may glorify your great mercy for endless ages. Amen. in Birmingham, network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Hi. Hi. Thank you. You see, you couldn't answer, so all these wonderful people from all over the country answered for you. Remember our AWTN prayer intentions for cardinals, bishops, priests, religious, lay people, and, and the leaders of all nations, especially the leaders of our own country, you know, charity begins at home. Well, we need to pray for them because sometimes even leaders don't realize the responsibility they have before God. If God made you a leader, he expects more out of you than anybody else. So let's pray for them, because prayer can change the world. Now we have nine, eight days of prayer, seven days. It has to be eight days. No, it has to be nine days. Here it is. <laughs> I thought I'd get your attention. Since I'm not good at counting, I thought you would be. It's October, it's called the Jubilee International Week of Prayer and Fasting. I know that doesn't sound too good, you know. But you can fast from a lot of things besides food. You can fast from your temper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How would you like to be gentle for one week? Doesn't that sound horrible? to be gentle for one week? Well, then do that. Fast from anger and give it to Jesus. Why are we praying? We're praying for the same thing that our EWTN family intention is. For leaders of the church, of our country, of the world, different countries in the world. So this starts October 1st of the 9th. And on the 9th, well, if you come to Washington, D.C. at the Basilica, of the Immaculate Conception, and then I'll be there too. I mean, we can praise our Lord and ask Our Lady to intercede. And see, the Holy Father's going to have that in Rome. A lot of dioceses are having the prayer vigil all, all day on the 9th and then Sunday, the 8th. And so there's daily Mass, daily Rosary, fasting, Holy Hours, and Eucharistic Adoration. And so you need to, this is, this is kind of long, but we have a pontifical mass. Here I am, Mother Angelica from EWTN. I'm keynote speaker, whatever that means. <laughs> What's a keynote? Anybody know what a keynote is? No? Whatever it is, I'm it. <laughs> 
So maybe it's the only one. I don't know. But I hope the shrine is full. It holds how many people? Three, four thousand? Five thousand? We're not very bright when it comes to numbers, you know. Now, is somebody going to do this or is it going to go? You want to take this, somebody? I didn't want to throw it to you. You want me to throw it to you? Yeah, I never did play basketball, but I'll try. You be the basket and this is your ball. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll see you on the 9th of October. And let's pray for that because I have to give a talk on Our Lady, which is not hard to do, you know, because she's so awesome. Even if you think of Our Lady in some small way, like how she kept house for Jesus, St. Joseph, how she cooked for them, how she acted, you know, nobody knew that Our Lady was Mother of God. Now, can you imagine all these people praying every day in their prayers, men and women and children, for the, the mother of the Messiah? And every mother wished that her daughter would be chosen as mother of the Messiah. But when the real one came, they never recognized her. Isn't that kind of sad, isn't it, huh? But see, that's the way of God, hidden. You know why he hid it? Well, the enemy has been looking for her for centuries. If you read the book of Genesis, you understand that the enemy intended to destroy her and the child. That's why he fell. He didn't have the humility to accept the eternal word, second person of the blessed trinity, to become man. We think we're pretty good, but we're really kind of dumb, all of us, compared to an angel. See, if I wanted to go to Italy right now, I would have to leave, find a plane, hope it stays in the air, <laughs> get to uh, Atlanta, then go to New York, and then take off for Italy. And then I'd be so tired, I wouldn't know what country I'm in. And I wouldn't care until maybe a day later. But an angel with the speed of thought Oh, hey, wouldn't you like to go that way, huh? You couldn't, you couldn't take the pressure because it's so fast. Speed of thought. It would be nice if you got an angel. I mean, you've got one powerful companion and one powerful protector. So we're not really bright, but we're bright, okay, according to our human nature. But that's why it's so hard for us to even think of being holy, because holiness is to some people to wear a halo. Well, you're not going to see a halo on anybody. Even the saints, some of the saints. You know the little flower? You all know her, huh? You all know the little flower? Well, the window was a little open in her room. That's it while she's dying. And you write something nice about people that are dying. And, and uh, these two nuns were outside a window wondering, what in the world will we say about Therese? <laughs> I bet their faces were red. <laughs> when they got to heaven and looking up like that, see? Because we don't know. We don't know. So everybody lived with canonized saints, but they didn't think they were canonized till they were dead. Now that's something, isn't it? You gotta die before anybody knows you're holy. It's never flattering, you know, if you're waiting for that crown in this life, you better forget it. Because holiness is very simple. That's why nobody sees it. It's so simple, everybody can be holy. And holiness is only doing the will of God in the present moment. That's it. I have nothing to do right now to please God. I have nothing to do except sit here and look at all of you and love you and pray for you and talk to you. That's all I got. Now, isn't that simple? Huh? And you have to listen. You paid a lot of money getting here, so you got to listen. <laughs> and all your, whole, uh, your, your bus drivers are nice, holy men. They're still driving a bus. I have nothing against buses, please. All you 
You know, they used to have an ad for Greyhound, wasn't that Greyhound bus? Say, you know, leave the driving to us. Well, I can imagine why they put that. 55 women, women in one bus. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be funny, but I don't think it was funny. I think it was desperation. <laughs> why are you driving straight ahead? Because that's the way I'm going. Why don't you drive in the shade? Because there isn't any. <laughs> are we going to stop for a restaurant? No. <laughs> why not? Because it's not time to eat. You just had your breakfast. <laughs> well, I'm hungry. Tough. <laughs> I bet that guy's tearing his hair up by the time he goes, is that true? <laughs> oh, yeah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you're going the right direction? <laughs> this map says you should have turned left. Now that holy bus driver is not going to say anything. My bet is thinking the next time I turn, you're going to fall out. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can afford to tease bus drivers because they can't do anything through a tube. <laughs> But that's just truth. Is it not truth? Yeah, it's truth. And sometime in the bus, you're sitting by the very person you thought ought to come here. <laughs> See, it's not only a bus driver has his problems, but tourists have their problems. When they want to eat, you're not hungry. When you're hungry, they've already eaten. Then you don't know where the water is. Where's the water on this bus? In the back. How do I get there? You walk. <laughs> I'll fall. No, you won't. We'll hold you up. You hang on to the seats. Oh. But by the time you get there, the thing is broke. Can't fix it till the next stop. When is that? 50 miles. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> Somebody whispers, please do. <laughs> <laughs> now, you pay for all of that. <laughs> and that's why you get so much merit when you make a pilgrimage, you see. But it's a pendant. You can't get excited over things like that, you know. It's a penance. There's really nothing you could, but it's designed to be a penance. All pilgrimages should be a penance of some sort. Shouldn't be hair raising, but it should be something difficult because you want grace from God. Hmm? Grace. And we all need grace. We all need special graces to stay because everything is so mixed up. You know? If your city is having a call to holiness or your parish is going to have a rosary procession, oh, go, please go. Show the Lord that we're together. We're united under him. And you have some of these parades. Oh, my, they're terrible. Well, you got to go as a Catholic. Join whatever your diocese or a national thing is going on because we got to show we're Catholic and we're very proud of being Catholic or Christian and very happy and proud of being Christian and we're going to go and show the world I love Jesus and I love his mother there's a purpose to this it's just not going to a, a doings you know there's a purpose to it if you manifest your love for Jesus whether you come here or go to Washington or go anywhere in your diocese you manifest your love for Jesus. See? You also manifest your love for the church and for your faith. So there's more to this, and I want to thank you all for coming. And this faithful, we've been here how many times? Three? You've been here three times? More than that. Yeah. It, that bus knows its way here without him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome.
I'm going to, to read. I just didn't know what to take this morning and this evening. God, I don't even know the time of day. <laughs> and I, I opened up to this where the Pharisees asked for a sign from him. And we're always asking for signs. Do you always ask for signs? Yeah? If you have love for the Holy Father, uh, for Our Lady, or you have love for uh, little Teresa, the little flower, you ask for a rose, all right? And you, you want this or that. You pray to St. Anthony to find something. But he, he, he you know, you kind of think, uh, who is St. Anthony? He was a great theologian. Uh, you know, he's not only the finder of lost things. Poor St. Joseph always has that lady in his head. I and I not understand the purity of it all, but he was not a florist. <laughs> <laughs> and poor St. Francis, I felt sorry for him. Uh, he either has birds <laughs> here, <laughs> or a wolf here, <laughs> Or little rabbits here, and he's not even pet. Uh, he's not even a patron saint of vets. <laughs> I think they should have made him patron saint of vets because he loved animals. But you know, we forget he had the wounds of Jesus. See, and he was so holy. At one time, he was saying his office, and the birds were singing along. And he was distracted. He couldn't pray. And he looked up at this flock of birds and he said, Now you be quiet until I'm through praying. And they all got quiet. And they all came down and just stood there with their heads down. Wow, wouldn't that shake you up, huh? <laughs> or shake me up. There's a man who, who uh, there was a wolf in this town, a little village. And he'd go out at night and he would attack people and everything. They were scared to death of him, this wolf. And they told Father Francis and he said, I'll take care of it. And he goes and the wolf's growling at him and he says, peace, brother. Oh, the wolf growls on the ground. He says, now you've been very bad and you've done terrible things. Now. I want you to be very nice and the people will feed you and I don't want to hear another thing from you. And he, he got to be very gentle, lived a long time as a wolf. All the people fed him, he didn't have any problem. Now you say, did that make you holy? No, he was holy first. And then the power of God came through him and did wonderful things. It isn't what you are or what I am that counts. It's who he is and how much room in me or you does, do you give him to do things like that? It's a matter of being empty of yourself and letting Jesus work through you. Now these Pharisees were doubters. They were looking for a king or a powerful prophet, somebody who would deliver them from Rome and make them wealthy again, a powerful nation. So the way they're looking for a military leader. Well, Jesus was nowhere near a military leader. He was meek, humble, poor. He even said, you should forgive your enemies. Hmm. If you were under some suppression, would you appreciate listening to that? Mm -mm. I always thank our dear Lord. I was born when I was, where I was, and knew the whole story ahead of time. Because how do you, you and I don't know what we would have done if, if we were in those circumstances. He never said the right thing according to what the people wanted. He was very popular with the poor because they were oppressed. And he, they understood what he wanted. Now, here's one example. The Pharisees came up and started a discussion. <laughs> everything we do is a discussion. You've got to have a discussion about everything. 
I've always wondered why they don't have a discussion before penance, before uh, confession. May it do you good. Uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's look at your sins now and see if you're saying the right thing. Maybe I could add a few to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we had a couple Padre Pios in this world, boy, he'd tell you what they were. And believe me, if you forgot something, he'd, he'd slam that door and say, I cannot give you absolution. See, we, we don't know. And we're always wanting something that's eh, not too good for us. So these Pharisees wanted proof. Do you ever want that proof? Hmm. And they demanded of him a sign from heaven to test him. Well, he is from heaven, and he is heaven itself, is God. Without God's presence, there would be no heaven. It's God's light and glory that makes heaven. There would be no heaven without him. So they were looking at the very God they were wishing for and missed him. I think that's the most pitiful thing in the whole wide world, to be wanting something so bad so long. And when it came, you never saw it. And that's what I'm always afraid that people who want hope to be holy, and it's very easy, and we miss it. Hmm. It's accepting the will of God in the present moment. You know, when I was a young sister, um, let's see, how old was I? Hmm. In my 20s, seems ages ago. <laughs> anyway, and we were in the we were not in the new monastery yet in Canton, Ohio, and and we were in the mansion. This wealthy couple gave us their home, and it was a mansion, and we cut it up. You know, we paid a room here and a room there. It didn't look much a mansion when we got through with it, but that's what it started to be. And everything happened to me that day. Everything. And so I had adoration at 11 o'clock in the evening, and I was not in a good mood at all. So I walked in, I knelt, and I stayed there, and I looked at our Lord, who's present now in the Blessed Sacrament, and I said to him, why does all this stuff have to happen to me? I'm trying so hard. And nothing works today, nothing, absolutely nothing. It's been a great big mess. And beside that, I went to my abbess, and she looked at me and said, as if he didn't know, she said to me, it's God's will. <laughs> and I said to the Lord, why does it always have to be your will? You're just so miserable. And I finally calmed down, and, and I heard this very gentle voice. And he said, try saying, it's my love. Well, like many times I talked to the Lord, I felt about this big, not even that big, you know. Well, I never thought that everything had happened to me in that moment or during that miserable day that it could be his love. And I was kind of tired hearing it was his will. That's all my abbess ever said to me, ever. Well, it's God's will, and I thought, that's no help. <laughs> well, you know, God has mercy on drunks, children, and nuns who are not very bright. <laughs> And I learned the hard way that everything that happens is his love, you see? Because his love and his will are the same. Huh? If I love much, then I will be virtuous. And the less I love, the more faulty 
and weak I become. So you'll do anything for someone you love. Well, see, these Pharisees couldn't understand that. That was way beyond them. They want a military reader. They want, but I want it now. If you don't have anything else, forget it. And we have to be careful we're not that way. So, and what, this is, this is so sad. It says here, and with a sigh that came straight from his heart, like, <sighs> that's what Jesus did. When these Pharisees demanded of him a sign from heaven, and the God of heaven was standing before them, boy, we got pretty stingy uh, <laughs> cough drops here, buddy. Are we out? Yeah. It's amazing I can go from the sublime to the ridiculous. You know? <laughs> but anyway, a sigh. Do you ever sigh that way? Huh? And everybody in the room knows exactly what you just said. And you didn't say anything. You go, Yes. Well, what <sighs> yes mean? It means you're a pest. What do you want now? <laughs> That's what it really means. Or somebody say your name. Elizabeth! <sighs> <laughs> yes. It's a sign. Our dear Lord didn't have that kind of sigh. Mm -mm. Our dear Lord had a sigh that came not from the head. Our sighs are from the head, which means I don't like you, I don't like what you're saying, and I'm not going to do what you want me to do. <sighs> That's from here. But his sigh was from here. Different. I didn't recognize him. Not even once. And so it says. He had a sigh that came right from the heart. <sighs> Disappointment. See? Disappointed. And he said to them, Why does this generation demand a sigh? Well, could you and I say the same thing? We all know the world's not in good shape. We pray for it. There's something in the heart that says it has to change. It has to change. You know, there are 800, 800 million Catholics in the world. Is that correct? Somewhere near there. Do you realize? that we, all of us together, if we were together, could change the whole world? Just imagine that. As 800 million Catholics all over the world, we, all of us, could change the world in a very short time. See? Why? Because our prayers, our love, our adoration before the Blessed Sacrament our penances. See, we could change it. Somehow we don't. That's why I keep encouraging you, go to these affairs, go to these things. Show your, show your Catholicity, show your love for Jesus. But see, these people weren't going to move. If you were not what they wanted you to be, you're out. And there's a lot of that today. Well, but that sigh came, I tell you solemnly, no sign shall be given to this generation. That's the worst thing he could say. Because even the sign he was going to give, the sign of, of his death, the sign of his resurrection, they weren't going to hear. And then he said, and leaving them, he embarked on the opposite shore. That's a very sad thing. 
that the conscience of a man the demands we have of God and with the demands we want from God would force him to go on the other side. See, he, he knew he couldn't convince these people. He knew they weren't going to listen. So all he could do is sigh out of sheer hurt. And there's all kinds of sighs. There's a sigh when you lose someone and you're crying, you're crying. It's a deep sigh that means you don't have any more tears. You just gave them up. Disappointment has a sigh. Something you wished would have happened and it didn't. That's a different sigh. Joy has a sigh, a kind of whoopee sigh. And then there's a sigh that's not good. Disgust has a sigh. But the sigh of Jesus was so deep, it had knowledge, divine knowledge, of who these people were. He knew he couldn't help them. He knew they were stubborn. And the kind of God they wanted, he couldn't be. What, what could he do? He left. He left them. Well, I hope our country doesn't do that. I hope our country wakes up and listens to Jesus. If he ever left us, God help us. God help us. And this is what he did. The disciples, when they got on the other shore, the disciples, if you wonder what I'm doing, I'm trying to find my handkerchief. <laughs> and it's ex extremely important at this point. I, I find it because <sighs> see that's what the Lord does to me in the middle of a serious conversation <sighs> my nose runs and <sighs> I'm sorry but I got a blow <laughs> That ever happened to you? Yeah. Well, when I was a kid in school, I forget what grade I was in, and I, I had to recite a poem, a very long poem called The Highwayman. Y'all know that one? Yeah, yeah? you. Yeah. No, he's going along, he goes click, 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 they're imitating the horse. And right then, the most crucial point of that poem Oh, I had to blow my nose. <laughs> the teacher looked at me and he said, why? <laughs> I mean, I spoiled the whole thing. He went, so why? So that kind of why that has a side to it. You, like, you didn't do that. And I, I said, why? He said, yes, why? I said, my nose was running, what else? <laughs> anyway, we shall continue since I got my handkerchief in the right pocket. So now, the apostles have gone through this and they saw the whole thing. So they went over to the opposite shore. Guess what? <laughs> they forgot to bring any food with them. I bet what our dear Lord said kind of scared them and they forgot the food. Italians would never do that. <laughs> never. We never eat so well as at a wake. 
<laughs> but then Jesus was always on it. He was always where he should be, in his heart and his mind. And he said to them, he gave them a warning. Keep your eyes open. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Oh, Jesus was not afraid to say it like it is. He knew they were after him, and he knew he would die. But he warned his apostles, be careful. Keep your eyes open. Do we today? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. What was the yeast of the Pharisees? Duplicity with most of the yeasts. Trickery. Pride, arrogance. They'd watch it. And they said to one another, now see, this has absolutely nothing to do with what Jesus is talking about. She got a warning. Did you see that? Did you hear that? Did you hear what I said? He's already said what he thought about the Pharisees. He told the apostles, keep your eyes open. Be on your guard. Do you know what they got out of that? It must be it's because we have no bread. <laughs> what that have to do with it? They thought he was upset because they had no bread. They missed the whole point. The whole point. And you and I do that. We know the law of God. We know the commandments. We know what the church says. That means what the Spirit is saying about morality, lust, birth control, abortion, we know all of that. But when we hear that what we don't want to hear, we change the subject. We change the subject. Nobody, nobody asked, well, what's he mean about keep our eyes open? Who, who should we watch? I mean, I, I think we should have asked that. And what they say? It's because we have no bread. And Jesus knew it. Good old Jesus. He's so sweet. And he said to them, why are you talking about having no bread? <laughs> this is the time he gave it to them. One of my favorite passages. <laughs> I said, this is Jesus. This is not me. I'm not making this up. It's on chapter 8 of Mark. Verse 17, if you got your Bible. I won't let he had given it to him. Do you not yet understand? <laughs> See, everybody calls me impatient, which is true. You're not lying when you call me impatient. But it just seems we're all hot and bothered about silly things instead of serious things. There's serious things going on, and we're missing it. And then he said, are your minds closed? Have you eyes that do not see? Have you ears that do not hear? Or do you not remember? See, he, he's almost desperate for somebody to listen to him. For somebody to listen to his church. His vicar. See, he was desperate. And I wonder today if he's still not desperate. Statues continue to cry and bleed. And <sighs> what happened? Nothing. Nothing. And so, if we're going to stand before Jesus and he would say, why are you talking about having no bread? Why are we talking 
about silly things? Why aren't we praying for mankind? Why aren't we praying for priests and religious and lay people? Teenagers. Teenagers. Why aren't we praying for the world? That's what the angel said, you know, to the three children of Fatima. They had seen him once. He taught them a prayer, and they were playing. Well, it's normal and natural for children to play. But these were special children chosen by God to give a message to the world that no prophet in the past could give. Why are you playing, he said. Pray. Well, and then he goes on, he said, when I broke the five loaves among the 5,000, how many baskets did you collect? See, he's trying to make them understand you're facing God. And that's the Eucharist. See, we have body, blood, soul, and divinity. I'm facing God. Not a symbol. It's a real person. And he says, Where, do you not remember? How many did you collect? And they said, 12. 12 baskets. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of scraps did you collect? And they said, seven. Then he says something I think, I think he would say to the whole world today. Are you still without perception? Oh. You know, this is a very short paragraph. It starts on really two paragraphs. It starts on 11, chapter 8, verse 11, and goes all the way to 21. Very important today. Very important. Are you also without perception? Hmm. When Jesus has gone so far as to live and to die for us, and then to become a horse, body, blood, soul, divinity, are you also without perception? Has he done all of this? And still, we don't know. Still, we don't believe. Mm. Well, we have calls. But I think we need always, always, I keep bugging you to go to confession. And, <laughs> and be honest, be honest. You know, you got to tell it all, whatever it is. You gotta tell it all. And sometimes we have these little vain things we confess, you know. Like the woman, I think I told you this one time, the woman who went to confession. This is a true story. <laughs> and uh, she confessed her vanity. And uh, she said she's very vain about how she looked all her makeup and all. She expected a kind of penance, you know. And she confessed that she spent uh, too much time on herself and all this. And she heard this voice on the other end, and he said, it's no sin for you, Molly. <laughs> She needed all the makeup she could get. <laughs> and I suppose it's good to, to confess these little things if they're really a problem. But we need to go to confession, huh? All of us. So some of you haven't been to confession a long time. I wish I had the gift of Padre Pio. No, you don't. No, you don't want me to have that gift. And women shouldn't be priests for that reason. They could never keep all those secrets.
you heard, uh, what did Father Peel? The least he did was 50 confessions a day. That's when he was sick. But he heard confessions all day long. And so did the crew of ours. Oh, unbelievable. He had 250,000 converts. Can you imagine that? One little guy had a high, high-pitched voice. And um, he spoke very frankly. And, and the people loved him, but oh, he gave it to them. And today, we have such a strange idea of love. <laughs> hey, we would call it cruel. But it was worth 250,000 people, and I think that's awesome. See. But remember, I hope our dear Lord never, never, never asks anyone who listens to EWTN or is a Catholic or a Christian, I hope he never has to say to any of us, are you also without perception? That would be sad. And now we have a call. Hello? Hello. Hi, where are you from? I'm Tony from Elgin, Illinois. And what is your question? Uh, my question, Mother, is first of all, I would like to say thank you for the many times your words have saved me and inspired me. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, my question is, when you speak of forgiveness and you say to always forgive your enemy, mm -hmm. um, and then the more you forgive, it seems like the more you get hurt. Yeah. How many times do you keep going back to forgive <laughs> before you draw the line and say, well, I have to pr protect my soul in the eyes of God, too? Uh, yeah, everybody answered you. <coughs> <coughs> the audience should have said 70 times 7. See, it all depends. Do you work with these people, these people? Do you live with these people? It depends a lot on who it is. Not that you forgive by who it is, but if you live with someone, you're married to them, or they're your children, you have to forgive 70 times, seven times a day. If the Lord would have said a lifetime, you might not be too bad. You can figure that one out. If you're 70 years old, be 10 times a year. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> but see, that's not the point, honey. The point is the heart. The memory has a hard time forgetting. See, that's the problem. We go by our mind. You can't go by your heart, mind. You gotta go by your heart. We must forgive from the heart. And sometimes, if this is a workman or somebody you see once a month or once a week, you have to forgive and forget. You can't forget, but you can must forgive. See, you don't have to put yourself in a position where they can smack you over and over, see. But that isn't the point. The point is that you're tired of forgiving. But when I get tired like that, I count all the times I've gone to confession. I'm 77, and after I was 18, that's when I began to know the Lord. I didn't know him before that. I went every week. So some of you mathematicians can figure out that I'm 77, and if I went every week, that's a lot at this point. But our Lord forgave me every single time. Every single time. Unlike myself or my neighbor, he forgave and forgot. It doesn't mean God doesn't see everything all the time. It means that he desires, his will is not to remember your sins when he sees you or lives in you, they are like not there. Hmm. That's the way he forgives. And, and aren't you happy? He doesn't remember. 
It doesn't hold your past against you because he looks at your desire now. Your desire. You say you want some forgiveness, true. Well, there are some people who will not forgive, and that's their big problem. If you forgive and they don't, that's not a, a concern of yours. The concern is how do you stand before God? You were born alone, and I can verify it, you will die alone. And all that matters at that one point that we call death, there's no one around, no one. Your mind is lifted up, so you have no memory, intellect, will. It's, I don't know what happens to it, but at that point you stand alone. There he will see how you forgive over and over. That other person will not be there at all. There you are. And it's all there. That's what you have to think of. Oh, I can see you get tired. But you see, he had to be tired too. Being God, being master of the world, having everything in his hand, and nothing, nothing, nothing lives without his keeping it in existence. And nothing dies that he doesn't will it from the smallest ant to the greatest person. You see, we're dealing with God. We have to act like God. If it's somebody at work, get another job. Maybe you can do that. But we all have a cross. Some we make ourselves. But we all have a cross from God himself. Designed specially for you. And that cross, whether it's physical, mental, spiritual, whatever it is, that particular cross is the main beam in your cross and the main reason why you will be holy and indicates your glory in heaven. Mm. Your entire glory in heaven will be dependent on how you carry your cross. So if we, I would suggest you, you think of the Lord you see, he's the only one that can give us courage to forgive. Especially when you know somebody's deliberately not forgiving. Well, you've got to pray for that person. That's what he said. Do good. What does it mean to do good? You can't give them a gift. You pray for them. That's doing good. I would do good. And I would ask Our Lady, who forgave as her son forgave, for the grace to forgive and not remember. We have another call. Hello? Yes, thank you, Mother, for taking my call. My question is this. How do we resist the temptation to despair? Well, any temptation to despair is not of God. You need to think of that. No temptation to despair is of God. The enemy wants you to despair so you forgive to ask forgiveness. You forget to ask forgiveness. And then you go without saying, I'm sorry, Lord, because that's all the enemy. Stay away from him. Know your enemy. He's not handing you roses. He's handing you hell. Don't be careful of, of any kind of despair. See, because... You must pray Our Lady. You must pray to Our Lady. You must pray to our dear Lord. He saved you. He didn't go through all of that so you could go down there. Mm -mm. He came to save you, and he wants to save you. 
And all heaven rejoices when you don't listen to those temptations. You see, those, those temptations come directly from the liar. And our dear Lord said to the Pharisees, oh. he said, you're like your father, oh boy, who was a liar from the beginning. Hmm. Not a pleasant thing to say, but it came from God. So the enemy was a liar from the beginning. He cannot give you truth. He cannot give you beauty. He can't give you anything that's good. He wants to take that good away from you. And the only thing he can do to a human being is to encourage him to despair. Your sins are greater than God's mercy. You're no good. You were never no good. And they go, on and on and on and on. Don't listen to the liar. He cannot tell the truth. And what a waste, huh, to spend your time listening to a liar. <laughs> Excuse me. That's kind of dumb. Well, I got 30 seconds left. That's what those cross hands mean. <laughs> He's not waving. He's telling me you got 30 seconds left. Well, are you sure we got the right thing here? I got to I got to do this, he said. I love you and I'll see you tomorrow night. Bye now. <laughs>To order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. In times of trial and suffering, God's love meets us in a special way. Let us offer prayers of thanksgiving for the gift of His mercy. Join the Marians of the Immaculate Conception for a special preview from the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, followed by the Mass and Celebration of Divine Mercy from Stockbridge, Massachusetts. It all begins Sunday at noon Eastern here on EWTN. visited Croatia 30 years ago. It is here where I, in part, received my vocation to the priesthood. One of the reasons why I think God called me back to Croatia 30 years later is to remind me of who these people are at a core. They are a family, and they are of a family of faith. Bless us, O Lord, and these gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. From Eastern Europe, savoring our faith with Father Leo Padalinghug, Sunday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on EWTN. During these trying times, it's easy to feel a bit shaken. Your EWTN family is here for you. We've created a place to help make sense of things, as well as provide encouragement and hope. It's a place where you can watch Mass every day, get prayers that will comfort you, adore the real presence of our Lord, read inspiring stories, get tips on homeschooling, and so much more. Just go to EWTN.com forward slash resources to start feeling connected again. What comes to mind when you think of confession? You might be feeling like, I'm afraid. What's the priest going to think of me? Or, since God loves me and forgives me, do I really need to tell my sins to a priest? Or maybe, if I go to confession, I'll feel awkward telling the priest everything, so maybe I should just wait. 
Well, it's time to understand that these distractions